Luke chapter 16. Father God, would you prepare our minds, prepare our hearts to receive what you want us to hear today? Lord, this is one of those sermons where I don't feel like I need to do a lot of explaining or exposition because it's just so plain. Thank you for the words written in red. Thank you for the words of Jesus Christ. May these words be both encouraging and convicting today. In Jesus' name, amen. So one of the best things, although one of the most challenging things I do as a pastor is I speak at funeral services. And the first thing I say at just about every service is this. The end of life on earth is not the end of life. The end of life on earth is not the end of life. And then I usually talk about, you know, the person that has taken that last breath. They are alive. God willing, they're in heaven. What's the other place they might be at? <gasps> Did you say that in church? Thank you for saying it so I don't have to. Just kidding. Yes, the end of life on earth is not the end of life. And as I was telling the kids, there's a lot of joyful, wonderful things. The Bible says our joy will be full. We'll have pleasure forevermore. I'll get to see my grandma, my grandpa, my relatives that have died, I'll literally be able to hug them again because we're going to have resurrection bodies. We're not spirits floating around. The Bible paints this picture that we're going to, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord wherever he is. And Jesus promised that he was going to come back for us. So those of us that, that die before he comes back, before the second coming, we're going to go wherever he is. But then the Bible says that new Jerusalem, that place is going to be descending to this earth. And the Bible promises that there is a new heaven and a new earth and we're going to be here like the Garden of Eden, but only better. And I'm getting excited already. I, I already did a sermon series on that. I can't, I can't go there because I'm just painting the picture for, yes, there's good stuff. In your bulletin, you're going to see a handout and in that handout, if you want to dig deeper, you want to know what the Bible says about heaven, there it is. I give you a, one of the books that helped me best. Randy Alcorn, give you a bunch of verses. Don't look it up now, please. Just give me 20 more minutes, okay? On the back side, if you have it there, does anybody have it? Look at the back side. What does it say? What's the name of it? Erasing hell. That's the other side. Because the end of life on earth is not the end of life. Francis Chan does a great job, I think, with compassion and truth looking at hell. And if you want to dig into that, which you should, that's a book that can help you. It's got a lot of scriptures. He got the title because he said the saddest day that he had in his whole life was the day his grandmother died. She had rejected Christ. So it was the saddest day in his life. He said, I would have done anything if I could erase hell out of the Bible. His point was, but I can't because it's there. And as he develops that, he said something that greatly convicted me. Francis Chan in talking about, you know, heaven is glorious, hell is oh no. He said something in that book that I'm paraphrasing, but he said, I realized that as a Bible teacher, I was almost apologizing for hell. You know, God is so good, but you know, you know, you don't want to go there. And then Francis Chan wrote this and it convicted me. Who do I think I am that I have to apologize for the word of God? Shame on me for thinking I can somehow soften the truth that Jesus didn't soften. And so ever since then, I just believe that what we got to do is we got to lay out, this is what the Bible says about heaven and hell. We just need to explain it. We need to lay it out and let the Holy Spirit do the work. If you come to this church, you know we talk about he is a God of grace and a God rich in mercy. 
You know that God will do anything to save. It is his will that all come to a saving knowledge of him. He literally delays the second coming so that you and others have time to repent. God is so good. And anyone that understands the Bible and understands the heart of God, I don't understand why you're not a Christian, but it's because God is giving you time to realize that the, the hurt, the bitterness, the rebellion, the independence, whatever you're doing to push God away, that you're only hurting yourself. So there's the book Heaven. There's the book Erasing Hell. And then I also reference Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem, who just lays it out real clearly. So there is so much we could say on these two topics, Heaven and Hell. With the rest of my time, I want to read the words of Jesus. We're in Luke chapter 16. I'm gonna read the story. Then we're gonna go back with some brief explanation. Then I'm gonna to go to another set of words by Jesus and we're ending. Then we're gonna have communion. And then there's a beautiful song that we're gonna sing, right? Because the end of life on earth is not the end of life. We are gonna be singing with the angels someday. We are. And we're going to start practicing that before we end our service today. Luke chapter 16, verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 19. Now, there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living. Another translation says, feasting every day. But there was a poor man, and he was named Lazarus. And he was laid at the gate, and he was covered with sores, Lazarus was longing to be fed with even just the crumbs that would fall from the rich man's table. Besides that, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and he was buried. Now in Hades, Hades being the place where the dead are at this point, right? This is before the resurrection. In Hades, uh, that rich man lifted up his eyes and being in torment... He saw Abraham far away along with uh, Lazarus, right? So the rich man cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus so that he just may dip his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham's child, remember, during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus' bad things. But now he is being comforted and you are in agony. We're going to come back to that. And besides all this, there's this, this great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over here to you will not be able to. None may cross over from here to there. There is no such thing as purgatory. It is appointed to man once to die, and that settles the issue. Verse 27. So the rich man, realizing he's not going to get a drop of water, says, then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. I have five brothers in order that he may warn them so they will not come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And I think this gets to the heart of the message. But he said to him, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, if they don't listen to the Bible, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. It's all written in red. That's Jesus' teaching. Oh, there's so many questions we could have about this. Let me just pick out a few, okay? Notice there is no hint of annihilation or soul sleep or we just go to sleep and this life is so hard and now I just get to sleep forever, which is what the world tries to paint a picture. There is no hint as Duncan Watkinson, you know, the missionaries here, he's, he's around Hindus all the time. Their premise is, well, I know it's bad here, but the next life I'll be, you know, I'll get another chance. There's no hint of that. In fact, it's just the opposite. Another thing that somebody pointed out, Jesus does not present this as a parable. 
Did you know in all of the parables of Jesus, you know, all the stories that he tells to teach, there's never a name given. It's, here's a story. There's a prodigal son. There's a, he tells all these stories. This time he literally says the name of someone. Commentators kind of divided on this, but they make the observation, this is probably a real story and a real teaching. Probably. That's not the main point, but it's an important point. Because if this is a teaching, we ought to pay real careful attention because we learn about the afterlife a lot of things right here. Let's go through it a little bit slower, right? Notice that rich guy, it's every day he's feasting. And it says the, the poor guy, what does he want? Just the crumbs. Did you catch the parallel, the good storytelling, that on the other side, it's just reversed? All I want is just a couple drops of water. You mean you wouldn't even share your crumbs over here, but all you want is water there. Do you see the contrast? That whole story about, man, even the dogs are licking his sword. Did everybody go like, ooh, like what I did when they? That means his, this poor guy is laying in the gates. He's got sores, uncovered sores on his body. Which speaks to this. The Pharisees, the religious people that day, and a lot of Christians today had this mindset that if I obey God, I'm going to get nothing but prosperity, health, and wealth, and gospels, and oh, it's all going to be good. That is a lie from the pit of hell. This poor man had faith in God. That's why he went to Abraham's bosom. He had sores on his body, couldn't get food, and the dogs are licking his sores, and yet He's the faithful one on this earth. That should just wreck the whole prosperity gospel and the false idea. I'm not saying God is out to get him. I'm just saying, hey, it rains on the just and the unjust. If you have a difficult life, if you have chronic health problems, if you have situations that just won't change, you have my compassion, right? Right? We as a church want to come alongside you. We want to help you. We want to support. We want to have empathy. But do not, do not give in to the false idea that if I just pray enough and I have enough faith that God's going to make all the bad stuff go away and I'm going to have a happy life, health, wealth, and prosperity. God may give that to you or he may not. That's not the point, right? See, there's a lot of good stuff in here. How about this? So the poor man dies and he's carried away by the angels. Billy Graham in his excellent book on angels makes the point that it's this verse that makes most Christians believe that at death, there's an angel that will usher us away. There's an angel that will take us to wherever the Lord is. We can't prove it, but we say, here's the story. The angels accompanied him, right? Then he went to Hades and he lifted up his eyes being in torment, and he saw Abraham far away. Some things to observe, to draw out from this next section. He's aware, he's conscious. Just like the thief on the cross, when he died, Jesus said what? Today you will be with me in paradise. Another scripture says, apart from the body present with the Lord, you're aware of the good stuff going on. But the same is true if you've rejected Christ. This rich man, he is conscious and aware, and in the, these are the words of Jesus. Again, I'm not adding to it. The words of Jesus, he's in torment. He's in agony. He mentions flames. Other places, it mentions darkness. So we don't understand how that all pulls together, but we understand this. It's not anywhere anyone wants to go. It should inspire a fear of rejecting your creator and a longing to go, huh, how do I get home? Did you know that the Bible says that God put eternity in your heart? Did you know that? This is why human beings who are not just animals, every human being asks the question ultimately, is there more? What's going on? Even, the, even after a hundred and... 40 years of evolution that were just animals, people still thought, you know, there's something more. There's something here. I like a lot of good science fiction, 
they are not Christian in their worldview. But the people always get around to asking, you know, I'm going to have to answer for what I did. You know, I wonder what's on the other side. God put eternity in our heart. He makes us curious, and he makes us wonder about it. Frankly, a lot of people don't want to think about it, right? Well, I don't want to think about death. Let's just enjoy today, especially in America where everything's so comfortable and good. It can be uncomfortable to think about eternity. But that's what leads you to the deeper joys. Notice that he's conscious, he's aware. Notice that he sees. Notice in this afterlife, he can communicate. Not only can he communicate, he can still communicate across the chasm. But there's a chasm, a chasm, I'm sorry, a chasm that he can't get there and you can't get here. Many of you have seen the illustration of Jesus bridges that gap, right? But that's not in the afterlife, that's here. There's a chasm. It is wishful thinking. And it does no one any credit to say, well, you know, maybe in purgatory, they'll get their sins burned off and they'll get their second chance. The Bible does not teach that. So we see all of this. Another thing we observe is this. You know, <laughs> okay, confession time. See if I'm anything like you and vice versa. I sometimes think, God, if you would just like write it in the clouds or, you know, you would just interrupt them in their dreams. I'm thinking about the loved ones I lost that don't know Jesus. God, you could do anything. Just like Paul, you could knock them down, blind them, um, you know, you know, do some miracle so they know you're there. Do y'all ever think like that? Is it only me? Okay. I, I'm like, do whatever it takes, Lord. And it could be this, 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 or this. Any of those miracles. What I'm really giving voice to is what that rich man was saying. Right? I'm saying, God, if you just do a powerful enough miracle, then they'll know you're real. Then they'll accept the Bible. Then they'll accept Jesus. And whew, everything will be good. But let's look again at what Jesus said. Because he's not being mean. He's telling us the truth. I beg you, Father, send, send, send Lazarus. Send someone back from the dead. Do one of the ultimate miracles, right? Send him there. I've got five brothers. God's answer is, Jesus' answer is, well, they already have Moses and the prophets. They don't even have the New Testament. He just says, they have the Old Testament. It talks all about me, right? No, 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 says the rich man, just like me. No, no, God, I, I know they have the Bible. I know that's true, and I know if we had, but they're not reading the Bible, so you need to interrupt their life and do a miracle, right? It's kind of what I'm feeling. It's what I'm thinking, Last verse, verse 31. If they won't listen to, if they won't listen to the prophets and Moses, if they will not listen to the Bible, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Even if someone rises from the dead. The Bible tells us what this is. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, it says the Bible is like a, like a tutor or a schoolmaster. The Bible, by getting in them, points to Christ. It's literally what it says in Galatians. So when the world, let me just say this, when the world, when Satan, when yourself thinks, well, I, gotta not, I can't hit him over the head with the Bible, I guess I better be quiet and just kind of talk, you know, generically about good stuff. You're literally depriving of the one thing that is going to point them to Christ. Now, please hear me. I realize that we do good deeds, right? Our good deeds will glorify God, right? We love them. The goal of our instruction is love. Yes, I agree. We tell them our, yes, 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 all of those things. But it's the word of God that has the power to convict, right? This is why I've said for years, when you get in a debate with someone, Instead of saying, I think you think, I think you think, I think you think. Can I do that again? I think you think. Let's just keep arguing on and on and on. Instead say, you know, 
I hear what you're saying, but the Bible says. You know, I hear what you're saying, but Jesus said. And then you just put it out there. They already know you're a Christian. So when you say what Jesus says, they'll actually respect you. Now, they might be mad. They might say, well, you know, why don't you just take that to church? They might be rude, but they already know you're a Christian. So stand up for Christ and tell them what Jesus said. Right? And you'll know, you'll know when to do the, the, the grace-filled stuff. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary, and I'll give you rest. Right? You'll know when to have that story, and you'll know when to say, you know, Jesus talked about the afterlife. Do you want to know what he said? Try that with some, one of your family or friends. Just say, hey, do you want to know what Jesus said? Tell me what you think of this, and then, hey, read it. What do you think of what Jesus said? See, you're putting it, you want them to be confronted with the words of Jesus. You want them to be confronted with the Bible, not, well, that's what you think. That's one of the most clever ploys of the enemy. Boy, does he have Christians quiet. Well, that's what you think. Yeah, I guess so. I guess we can't argue. I'm not arguing. I'm saying, I hear you. This is what I believe. I believe what Jesus says. Does that make sense? That's not mean. That's not mean. That's actually kind. But it's also sometimes challenging, which is why we need to pray, okay? All right. Here's where I want to go to finish. I'm going to another section of where Jesus spoke. It's on Matthew chapter 10. Whew. If you think that was something, you ought to check out Matthew 10. I mean, Matthew 10, he basically is telling them, hey, guys, you want to follow me? It's going to be a hard road. Hey, guys, you want to follow me? You got to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and you got to count the cost. Um, and I want to pick up at verse 27 to 33. I keep these cards on my desk. At one point, we gave them out. I did a series on being an ambassador for Christ, so they were all in purple, and it was just a reminder. One side says, every Christian is a missionary or an imposter. Hmm. That's from Charles Spurgeon. Every Christian is a missionary or imposter. Every time I read that, I'm like, <gasps> when's the last time I should? I don't even know. Guys, don't overthink it. Uh, do you know how you can be a missionary? You know, I've, I've used this illustration because it's how I get my hair cut short. I just start talking to the person who's cutting my hair. Inevitably, they'll say something and then I'll ask a question you know, about God or, or Jesus. And then part, soon they're talking to me. You just plant the seed. A missionary is just someone who brings the message. Um, person that waits on your table, just say, hey, we're about to pray right now. Is there anything I can pray for you and your family? If not, that's okay, but I'd love to pray for you. <sighs> I distracted myself, which I often do, sorry. On the other side, is this powerful set of words from Jesus that I'm going to read right now. I keep this on my desk, in my car, to remind me that this is how simple it is to become a Christian and how, how, mm, how Jesus wants you and I to be a fork in the road. Jim Elliott, the missionary, said that I want to be in a fork in the road that they have to think about Jesus after hearing me. Listen to the words of Jesus. After calling us to discipleship, he says, verse 27, what I'm telling you in darkness, speak in the light. What you've heard whispered here, proclaim on the housetops. Do not fear those who can kill your body, but are unable to kill your soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both your soul and body in hell. And then he goes on to tell us how valuable every human is. Listen, are, are not two sparrows sold for a penny or a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the Father. The very hairs on your head are numbered. So do not fear, you are valuable, more valuable than many sparrows, okay? So context, he said, don't fear the world. Don't fear parents or labels. Don't fear anything except the one who can decide if you go to heaven or hell. That is what he said, right? Then he says, you're valuable. And then he goes to this. Verse 32 and 33. This is what's on my card. 
Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men or before humans, everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess that person before the Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny him before my Father is in heaven, who is in heaven. Next verse, don't think that I came to bring peace, and then he talks about I call people to decide. There's gonna be divisions within family. Folks, we do a lot of messages on grace, encouragement, rightly so. Next week, I'm beginning a series on, on being satisfied, on joy, habits of joy-filled people. That's where we're going. Today, I'm reporting to you and reminding you of the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. The end of life on earth is not the end of life. Have you confessed Jesus before other people? Not saying, well, you know, I, I, I told him, but I don't want to be embarrassed. No, he wants you to confess him. I trust Jesus. I believe Jesus will pay for my sins. I'm all in. I don't understand it all. I even have doubts, but I'm all in. I'm confessing Jesus before people. If you haven't done that, you need to do that. I implore you to do that. Why do I beg you? Because the Bible says as an ambassador, it literally says, we who are ambassadors should implore you, should beg you, oh, be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, his son. That's what the Bible tells me to do. So here today, that's what I'm doing. I'm begging you. Listen to the words of Jesus. If this reflects where your heart, your will is, when we pray, you say, I am confessing Jesus with my mouth because I know you'll confess me before the Father. I'm coming by faith through grace. I can't do anything else except say yes to your wonderful gift, right? And if not, if not, my prayer is that Jesus' words would follow you around. That's all. After we pray this prayer, worship team's gonna come up and we're gonna have communion. Communion is one of those things Jesus told us to do. Communion is about remembering the blood that paid the price so that we could be in the family of God. We Christians love to do it. it it's a great time to do a reset and a reminder. So that's how we're gonna end. And then Alan is gonna be leading us in a hymn of heaven. Some of the very words that, that the angels are already saying, holy, 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 worthy is the lamb. What a great way to end the service. Y'all still with me? Let's pray. Let's, let's take care of those that maybe you've never confessed Jesus. Or maybe you have and you've been far away. I want you to just pray something like this. Make it your prayer, but I'll, I'll give you a guiding prayer. You ready? Father in heaven, we know it's your will that all would be saved and come to a saving knowledge of you. We know that. It's in the Bible. If you're thinking about this, just if you can agree with this, pray it, pray it yourself. Pray, God, the words of the Lord Jesus, they affect my heart. I wanna, I wanna trust Jesus. What you need to just pray is something like this. I confess, I confess Jesus is Lord. Jesus is is Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus will pay for my sins. And then you can pray something like this. By grace, meaning you, don't, you didn't deserve it. By grace, I receive the gift through faith. Ask somebody about that, but pray this. By grace, I receive the gift by faith. Thank you, Jesus, for coming inside my life. Thank you for coming in my life right now. Teach me your ways. If there's someone here who did that as a child and you've just wandered so far away and you're like, well, I already did that and blew it. You need to hear the word of God that says, if you would confess your sin, he will cleanse you. And just confess and say, I've been far from you, Jesus. But today I'm coming home. Today I'm surrendering again. For those of us that are believers, let's pray something like this. And again, you pray it in your own words or pray after me. 
Father God, we choose to humble ourselves. We can't do anything to make ourselves right, but we're thankful for the blood that covers us, the blood that paid for all our sins. As we move into a time of communion, God, would you search my heart and show me if there's anything I need to talk to you about. In Jesus' name.